Folks, it's always a joy to see God call people out from our own ministries to be a minister of the gospel. And I remember when I first came here, um, I prayed that God would open up some doors and uh, let uh, me invest in some men. And uh, I kept um, we, I, I kept seeing Richard and God kept saying, you need to talk to him. And I said, well, he, he, he don't look like someone that really wants me to be his friend. Um, you know, he just kind of stone faced, you know, and I didn't know how he would take it. So I felt like a little kid when I went up to him, I said, Richard, I, I would like for us to be friends and, and to invest in you. And if you would be okay with that. And over the last three years, we have become very close and I have seen him go from a man that knew of God and desired a relationship with God to being a man that becomes the example of other men. I'm not saying he's perfect. None of us are. But I've seen a man that strives every day to be closer and to be more Christ-like. And that's what the Bible asks of each of us. So it's always good when we see God calling people out. There's other people in our church that are young, much younger and, um, than me and Richard. And God's dealing with them. And they're going to Bible schools and seminaries. And I look forward to the day where we recognize them as missionaries and pastors and ministers of music. And whatever capacity God has for them. So it's an exciting time. If you're turning your Bibles this morning to 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 Thessalonians 1, I'm going to be talking about the church's testimony. Now, folks, the testimony is a pretty powerful thing. It sums up so much of who and what we are as far as it comes to being believers in Christ. So I looked up the definition just so we would have a working definition of what is a testimony. What is a testimony for each of us? And it's simply this, evidence testifying to something. It's an evidence testifying to something. Now, as you can see, every one of us in this room has one. Every family in this room has one. Every ministry in this church has one. And our church family as a whole has one. We all have a testimony. Now, whether it's good or bad, whether it's beautiful or ugly, there's not a soul in this room that doesn't have a testimony in Jesus Christ. So I, I want you to truly pay attention to what I'm sharing with you today because I want it to mold you, to shape you, and to challenge you, especially when it comes to this church and this church body. I would ask you this, what do you think people would say of you as a person? What would people really say? Have you ever wondered that? What would, you, what would be your testimony as a Christian believer? It was popular a few years ago. When we say, could you be convicted as a Christian if your testimony was your witness? Could you? Would people ex acknowledge that you are truly a believer in Christ? Not to your, not to your face, but I'm talking about to the world. It's amazing um, what we'll say to others when they're around and what we'll really say to others when we're not. And how would your testimony stand in light of others? This morning we see in our text that Paul is writing to the church of Thessalonica. Now this church is a very impressive church. Matter of fact, in the first few verses, verses 1 and 2 that we're going to read, it gets high praise and high regard. There's something about this church that stands out and something that makes it quite different. And I think there's some things that we can learn from it. And, and folks, I'm here to tell you when uh, this is one of those uh, sermons that some people are going to go away feeling happy and some people are going to go away and you're going to have roasted pasture for lunch. You're going to think that I'm being mean and, and I'm not. I'm challenging you though. But I think there's some things in our text today that our church need to glean words of wisdom from and absolutely reflect in the way we are. So with that being said, let's read our text. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, for we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you let us pray father that you would choose us what does that mean what does that look like to a lost and dying world father i pray that we would be astute 
to what's being shared here today because, Father, I believe it needs to be said amongst our church and every church. For, God, there are things that need to take place, and, God, Paul has shared them already with us. So let our hearts and minds be open. Let us be ready to give an account of our testimony in a way that will bring honor and glory to you. So, Father, as always, uh, don't let me mess it up. Lord, don't let my personal passions oversee your personal will for this message. And we'll praise you for all things. In Jesus' name, all God's children say, amen. So the Thessalonian church was one of great example. It's one that a lot of people knew about. Matter of fact, if you read verse 8, it says this. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. Folks, there's a lot we can learn from what's being said here about this church. And, and I want to challenge us today. Is it, It's the same set of Del Norte Baptist Church. Many times I say stuff like in all other churches and all the churches in America. But folks, I want us to focus today on Del Norte Baptist Church. And do we reflect the testimony of the church that's talked about in Thessalonica? Amen. <laughs> but my, but, <laughs> I've never heard anyone say I'm sorry out loud. Okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> but here's the thing, folks. Where, where do we stack up with what we're going to be learning today? Where do you stack up? You see, if we're not careful, we're going to walk in and we're just going to listen to a sermon. We're going to walk out. And the reason we're suffering in churches in America today, and honestly, even in our own church in some places, is because we don't understand what a real church's testimony is and how we play that role. The meat of our text this morning is found in verse 3. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. The testimony of church is one that's found with faithful works. What does Paul mean when he says, your works of faith? Paul's addressing the one thing as believers that push us forward, and that's our faith. Folks, somewhere in the church, somewhere along this path, our faith has grown weak. It doesn't burn like it once did. I put something um, on Facebook this past week from W.A. Tozer. I'm reading through his works and his books. If you've never read them, don't read them unless you want to reflect on yourself of where you're not with God. But it says the reason most people don't look to God for answers is because most Christians have already decided they're not going to listen anyway. But yet we find here a church has faithful works. Is a church that had no guarantees. It had no guarantees that everything was going to work out. It had no guarantees that everything they did was going to work and be perfect. All it was known was a church of faithful works. Works, matter of fact, I, I wrote it this way. It was a strong faith that stirs, arouses, and activates and energizes believers to work and carry out the mission of Christ. It's a faith that helped them proceed to the climax of accomplishment. Does your faith stir your heart anymore? Do we do, we do things for God because listen, we, we say, I have faith that God's going to move. I have faith that God's going to touch. I have faith that God's in my life. And it pushes us to the brink of places we've never been. I, I love the song. Um, I don't ever can remember the title. It might be Oceans, but it's Take Me Farther Than I've Ever Been. Let my feet go deeper than they've ever been. Do we have a faith that pushes us to a point that we're out of our comfort zone? This church did. It did things so much so that it was known all around the land. Do people know of Del Norte Baptist Church? Not only in this community and city, but in New Mexico. Do we walk in such a, and have such faithful works that others say that is a good example? Now we have been blessed. We've got many people that have visited and even joined other, other uh, communities from around the state. Uh, many have left and they're moving to Albuquerque for work. And they've come and I ask them, I said, what brings you to Del Norte Baptist Church? And this is what they say. They say, well, our pastor from wherever we come from 
said that if we were going to go to any church in Albuquerque, that we should come to Del Norte Baptist Church because God is doing something at Del Norte Baptist Church. And I want you to know something, Pastor. We could not wait to get here. Folks, I'm proud to say that God's doing some great things here, but he's not done, and we must continue in our faithful works. And I'm afraid over the last three years that we've accomplished so much in the name of Jesus that some of us are getting a little bit like a day's going our efforts. After three years, we're starting to say, well, we can cool our heels, and we can kind of get a little bit uh, lax in our efforts. And my friends, that's wrong. I've seen churches do this time and time again. They begin to not be faithful with their works anymore. They begin to lay out of the ministries that they're so desperately needed to be in. This church was known greatly because of what it did. I challenge you. It's Del Norte known as a church with faithful works. Or are we a church known that had faithful works? We must be careful. 1 John 5, 4 and 5 says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Folks, you're needed. Your faith is needed. You say, well, pastor, I'll be honest with you. The music doesn't move me like it once did. And I love you as a pastor, but I'm not getting much out of your sermons either anymore. That's okay. But here's where I would challenge you. Where did the world become so much of a part that we began to judge the ministries that we're a part of? You know what? We may not be the best in the world. But we give the best we have every day and every week. And if we're not careful, our faith will be judged on the faith of others. And that's not the way it works. The reason this church was so amazing and so unique was because their faith was one of unity. They didn't judge every single ministry and every single person. I've told you time and time again, if you want to get your feelings hurt, join the church. You want to deal with judgmental people, come to the church. You want to get your heart broke, come to the church. You say, Pastor, why would anyone come to the church? Because it's a place of help and hope and healing in Jesus Christ. But listen, some people aren't there yet and they can be hurtful. But let me remind you, hurt people hurt people. They just need help and hope. And they come and they're looking for people of faith. People they can depend on. People they can draw strength from. When people come here, do they see your faith as something that helps anchor them to Christ or something that would push them away? Not only do we see faithful works here, but it's labors of love. You see, it's love that stirs the church to labor. That word labor means to toil, to labor to the point of exhaustion, to arduously labor. It means that one or a body, a church, work to the point that sacrifice and pain are part of the efforts. Love laborers are ones that look at the need and not the cost. If we're not careful, we'll start counting our pennies and counting our time to the point that we say it's not worth it. But this church was known as one that labored to the point of sacrifice, to the point of exhaustion. My friends, do we labor to the point of sacrifice and exhaustion? Do we labor to the point that we're giving all that we have? The believers who are driven to love are believers who have a true sense of God's love in their own life, and their own heart. Did you fall out of love with your first love somewhere? That somewhere along the way, God didn't look if it was appealing. Your walk with Jesus somewhere started to die. You just, it's just something that's a part of your life. It doesn't become your life. There's no sacrifice involved. There's no, there's no real pain. You see, in Americana, we don't understand this type of love labor. We're so accustomed to being taken care of. 
We're so accustomed to, to us getting our needs met that we've forgotten that God's called us to meet the needs of others. And we don't understand what it means to go out and to give and to sacrifice with our time and our talents and even our ties. We judge what we can do on the time that we want to give, not what God has called. Unfortunately, we fall short. Do you have such a labor of love of the gospel of Christ? Folks, the hurt and the sick aren't coming to churches anymore. Have you noticed that? America's lost hope in the church. You say, how do we know that, Pastor? Look at the empty chairs. Albuquerque, the last three or four weeks it came out, was ranked as the number one city in America to be worse to raise your family in America. Did you know that? We're the number one city in America that you should never raise a family in. We're the fifth most dangerous um, city in America by the ATF to live in. We're the second worst driving state in America. You know that's true. <laughs> People are hurting left and right. Our, 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 the crime is in the streets. Uh, man, we're almost compared to Chicago. I know, that's terrible. You're from Chicago. I'm sorry. You thought it was going to get better. But folks, look around. We got empty seats. Why? Because they don't see hope in the church anymore. Why is that? Because they don't see the church having hope in God. We struggle just like everyone else. And, and we don't labor like we should. We don't work like we should. We don't give as we should. Our sin is as great as those without Jesus. And we forgot what it means to sacrifice for the Savior. And for many, coming to, the, coming to church and being a part of the family, it's more of a calendar or scheduled event once a week than it is something we do every day of our life. And we're raising our kids in such a way that we wonder why, 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 do the, why the millennials not want to come and be a part? Well, one, first of all, they heard their moms and dads talk terrible about the church and its servants for so long. Why would they want to be a part of it when they had the freedom to choose? Let's be honest, folks. Most of the problems we're facing with the millennial generation was our fault. It ain't theirs. They learned from example, why would you want to be a part of something that all they heard for years growing up when they got in the church was sermon went too long, music wasn't that good, I didn't get my favorite seat, I don't like that translation of the Bible, that person hurt my feelings. Why would anyone want to be a part of such a thing? Instead of being raised, you know, when I was raised, my dad, when we were building, we, we did a church plant. I've told you before, we got the Billy Graham Award for being in the top 1% of the fastest growing churches in America. We started out with 49 people. Six years later, we run over 600. Pastor, how'd you do it? How'd you do it? We worked. I picked rocks up when they, when they built the sign in front of the church. It was my job to go pick up the leftover brick. And let me tell you something, some masons can make a mess. I had to pour sawdust in the block building walls. I don't know why, but that's what we did. We poured sawdust. They said it was good for insulation. I helped paint. I, and then as we grew, um, I helped put the hardwood floors down in the gymnasium. And when I mean I helped, I just went and got the wooden carried. I was a pot mule for the church. My dad would come home. Let's go. I didn't even think about it. I knew every day my dad was going to have me at the church. Well, let me tell you something, folks. I saw miracles. I saw people healed of cancer. And I saw families that were falling apart, being restored. And I saw men that you wouldn't trust with a dime become deacons of the church. Because we labored for love. Why are churches dying today? We forgot what it means to labor to the point of sacrifice. Our children's ministry needs your help. 
Our student ministry needs your help. Our sign language ministry needs your help. If you can sing, our choir needs your help. It's half full. Why is my choir half full? We're running anywhere from 340 to 400 on Sunday mornings, and we can't fill up a 25 thing. Of course. You mean to tell me there ain't 25 people who can't sing a joyful noise to the Lord? Well, preacher, that means I got to go to church on Wednesday night. Well, what else are you doing? Well, preacher, that's kind of mean, ain't it? No, it's not mean. It's the truth. 90% of the church in America and down Lordy Baptist Church sits in the pew, sits in the chairs on Sunday morning and that's the most we can hope to get out of them. A lot of them don't even come to Sunday school. Well, that's the one day I get to sleep in. Well, la da I hope Jesus Christ didn't sleep in on the day they decided to put him on the cross. I'm Baptist, I can't make it. Been working all week. Folks, we forgot what it means to toil to the point of exhaustion. This church was recognized by Paul and some of the greatest of their day as being a church of example, exemplary because of their faithful works and because of their love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And lastly, they had a steadfast hope. There's several reasons why a person works. There's forced labor. A person is forced to work. This is what my boys would say I do to them. They don't get a choice. I need, I need the grass cut. Maybe later. Psh, I said now. I love, like I say all the time, hands been one of the greatest tools in my ministry at home. Son, I need this done. I get it later. No, you won't see Hannah if you don't do it right now. Okay, I'll do it right now. Thank you, Hannah. You have no clue how much help you are. <laughs> There's a sense of duty. A person feels obligated to work. There's a need to meet necessities. A person has needs that have to be met. You want to eat. You want clothes. Please wear clothes. Some of you probably get away with it. It wouldn't be that bad. But the rest of us, please wear clothes. It'd be obnoxious for you not to. And there's a wish to gain more. A person works to build up wealth. But my friends, when we accept Christ, our motive for working changes, we now serve to work for Christ. Our love for Christ and for us stirs us to be steadfast. You know what that means, steadfast? It means you don't just say, I'll go do one thing. It means I'm not done until God calls me home. My generation as a whole has failed. I'm not saying everybody in this room, I'm just saying the generation that I was born in as a whole has failed. We still lean more on those 60 and over more than we should. The problem is those that are 60 and over, well, I've done my time. My friends, we still greatly need you. We need your example. We need your help. We need that steadfast example in our lives because it's not being seen anywhere else. If God took everyone 60, 65 and over in the church today, there'd be far less of the church. As a matter of fact, it would take about 70, 80% of the church. We need the example of steadfastness in our lives. Steadfastness means endurance and perseverance. We know that the Lord will guide and provide and deliver and strengthen and sustain and bless. But we must have an endurance. We must have a perseverance. We must be steadfast in our hope, knowing that our reward is to come one day. But my friends, we must walk courageously, knowing that no matter how hard it gets, we're going to push through it. Let me tell you something. Doing RAs and GAs on Sunday afternoons at four is probably not the most exciting thing in the world. But we need men. Folks, we need men more than anything in this church. I'll just be honest with you. You ladies, if you stop working today, we would, we, we would die. And the men, yeah, well, I'm a little offended you said that. Let me tell you something. If it wasn't for the women, there'd be no children's ministry on Wednesday night. Where are the men of God that are examples for these young men to learn from? 
Where's the steadfastness that these men, can, these young boys can look to and know what it means to be a man of God? Women can't teach that. No more than a man can teach how to have grace and mercy like a woman can. We have got to work together. We need all of you. This church was the example of other churches because it understood what it meant to give everything. And most people in the church today, unfortunately, even at Del Norte at times, we make every, we're just like Moses. We make every excuse in the book why a nation should stay into slavery. Because we think God can't use us. But God can use anyone. We need your help. We have a great testimony. But there's, need, there's greater needs, folks. We're doing a lot of things, but we need more steadfastness in what we do. I, I don't, we don't need you to show up for one event. We need you every single week. If God stirred your heart to be a part of something, then be a part of it. If you can lead, lead. If you can follow, follow. Look, we don't need tons of leaders, but we need a lot of followers. If you're looking for a church you can get involved in, you found it. But if you're looking for a church where you can just come and hide, there's other places. There's other places. Because Del Norte needs to be a church that when people think of faith, they think of us. When they think of workers, they think of us. Let me ask you two questions. They're going to come up on the screen. What part are you playing and how are you serving to see Del Norte Baptist have such a testimony? What are you doing? How is the Lord calling you to work and serve at Del Norte Baptist Church? And let me tell you something. I mean from the youngest sitting in front of me all the way to the oldest person that's about to walk over and see Jesus. What part are you doing? The worst thing we've done to our youth in this nation is that like your day is coming. It's now. It's now. You want your schools? Go get your schooling. Claim it. Stop whining about how bad it is and make a difference. You want your work to get better? Start letting them see Jesus. Men, you want your families to be better? Be the example that God have a steadfast love and work and faithfulness in your family that your wife and your kids want to live out that example, not shun it. I know I pick on men. I'm going to hush up with this. Men, you want your sons and daughters to be the children of God, then let them see what a children of God looks like by being men and women. God didn't call your wife to be the spiritual leader. He called you to. There's a lot of times I didn't want to go to church growing up. There's a lot of times my daddy had to use strong correction. But my dad always came back and said, son, here's why it's important. My, you say, well, should you make your kids go to church? I believe you should. But I also think we should constantly remind them, why is it important that we're part of the body of Christ? The body of Christ is every day, not Sundays. That's why my dad said, son, we go to church to worship, but we live for God every day. It's important that we strive to work for God every day, but we go to worship to get re-energized and refocused. My father made me go, but he made me go with purpose and reason. And that's where we mess up sometimes. I tell my boys, let's go. Oh, dad, we have to go to everything. First of all, you don't have to go to everything. I go to everything. <laughs> but your example is needed. There are people here today because they slept in. They ain't here. Their favorite team plays at 11. So they ain't here. Their favorite hobby of hunting took them away and they won't be back for weeks. If we're going to be the church that God wants us to be, my friends, we're going to have to make painful sacrifices. But there's a great reward. There's a great reward. But it's not here. You'll get a handful here. We'll get to see our sons and daughters know Jesus. Maybe you'll get to baptize a friend like I did. I got to baptize my daddy. 
I got to baptize my brother. I got to baptize my two sons. Some of the greatest days of my life. But my reward is when I step across the spiritual Jordan. And Jesus said, you did a good job, son. Come on home. You're done. That's the reward.